I think okay. the, the AirPod is better. Let's try it again. Yeah. AirPods there. Now it's uh, now it's connected to the AirPods. This is Regin's Travels podcast. Okay, hello everyone. Welcome to another episode of Regin's Travels podcast. My name is Regin Reino. Joining us in this episode is a man who has visited every country in the world. He was able to do it at the age of 29, becoming the youngest Norwegian to have done so. His name is Jorn Bjorn Augustad. Hello Bjorn, welcome to the podcast and thanks for being here. Hello. Yeah, thanks for having me. How are you doing there in Nor You're in Norway, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I just came back from a trip to the UK and France and I'm back in Norway for another week or so before I start another 10 month journey, Whoa. which I'll tell more about. <laughs> That's yeah. crazy. Yeah, I saw your interview on YouTube with the Philippine Global Explorers, which I'm also part of with Risa and the topic oh. was traveling during the pandemic. Wow. Yes, yes. I'm very much into that. I've been spending most of my time during this pandemic traveling, uh, mm -hmm. visiting over 20 countries. So right. um, it didn't stop me from, from, from going away. You've traveled to every country in the world. Wow. It's, it's a huge accomplishment. First of all, congratulations for <laughs> accomplishing okay. that. And you're able to finish it in 2019, the year before the pandemic. So how do you feel when you finally landed yeah. in the final country? Well, actually, the last country was kind of an anticlimax. Um, I was by myself. I was out of countries to visit. And this goal that I had for nearly 10 years, um, which was my everything, I focused all my, I mean, I sacrificed health and money and career and even relationships to, to make this goal. And I had enjoyed it on the way. So when I came to the Seychelles, I felt uh, actually I had a couple of days where I felt a bit down um until i realized and i thought back on what i had actually achieved and i thought about the future how i can still travel to countries that are not countries which is the title of my my next book so um it didn't slow down my travels i have actually traveled just as much since that time and uh now i, f I feel good about it i'm i feel glad that i spent the time when I when it was easier um, because it is more challenging traveling now during this this time than before. Why do you feel you've mentioned that you feel kind of like sad during that final country? What, what do you think is the reason why you felt down to think that you're able to finish all the countries in the world and that was your final final stop? What do you think is the main reason? Well, I think that's something that can happen. It doesn't matter what type of goal but actually working on the goal itself, I mean, the, the journey itself is, is, is what I enjoyed. And there was, there was nothing, you know, good about being finished with it somehow. I mean, it, it's, it was something I could, you know, write my book about and talk, talk about, but I'd rather be in the process of discovering every, every country because I, I will never be able to go to a country and say, oh, you know, this is my first day in this country. You know, the first two two days, I feel like the like the you get so many impressions from the countries you visit when you haven't been there before. And for me now, it will just be returning to a country and um, yeah, no more you know country virginity for me. So it was like, I mean, I was I was I was happy about it, but at the same time, I felt like, oh, I wish this could have just continued the way it's been been going. Yeah, I remember the feeling of just being in a new country and it's it's really different. You know, the excitement before yeah. going to that particular country and actually just landing at the airport, there's a different feeling. And I can relate to what you're saying because I've been to quite a lot of countries as well and going back to the same country twice isn't as exciting. You know, you don't have that feeling anymore. That is quite hard to explain. Mm. It's like you have butterflies in your stomach kind of thing. And once you've been to that country, the excitement is gone. So I think that's one of yeah. the downside of finishing it all. 
I think of it as like a high of traveling. You know, I, your brain is just working on full power, trying to figure out how does this work here? What is special about this country and so on? Your brain is trying to make up its mind about what does it think about this place? But when you go back to a place you've been before, you already know what to think about that place. So yeah, I, I agree with you there. Right. And one of my favorite travel quotes says, one of the pleasantest sensations in the world is waking up in waking up in a new town, something like that, is one of the yeah. pleasantest sensations in the world. And once you've been to all of the countries, then you won't have that sensation anymore. And I, th the last time I felt this was when I was in Mexico during my around the world trip. That was my first time in Mexico because prior to that, I've traveled quite a lot, but to the same countries which I have been to already. So that was in a long time. That was the that was the first time that I was in a new country, and I felt that feeling as well. I arrived in the evening, actually at night time mm -hmm. around near midnight 11 p.m and it was all dark right because it's, it's obviously it's nighttime so when i checked in in my hotel and i was about to sleep i had this excitement of what i'm gonna see the next day yeah in the morning so i was just looking through my window and it's like whoa i'm in a new country i haven't been here before this is mexico i've been reading about this watching this in movies and you know that excitement and i haven't yeah, felt that in a, like in a long a while again it's like being a kid yeah. again exactly yeah yeah, yeah. I have uh, I'm, I've realized that there are actually so many countries that are not countries. I mean, we have 193 UN members in the world, and those I have all visited. But if you go to a place like Kosovo or Taiwan or Greenland or Faroe Islands, they're all different, and even though they're not members of the United Nations. So the last months, this summer, I have visited, say, 20 of those countries that are not countries, like Transnistria, Oh, wow. um, Jersey between, you know, UK and England, you have Gaugasia, you have so many places with its own language, its own culture, its own history, places that used to be countries before, uh, places that are kind of countries, they have their own passports, their own immigration, their own national anthem, everything, mm -hmm. but uh, they're not recognized as countries. Right. So, um, so that's my goal now of visiting those. All right. So while for writing about it. Yeah, yeah. So for this count that you've had visiting all of the countries, is this the UN countries? You're counting just the yes. UN countries, yeah. 193. Yeah. Right, right. Because some people, they are, like, especially with the, I don't know if you know, the Traveler Century Club, they're, they're counting not just mm. UN countries. And, and for me, I'm also counting countries, and I also include those countries which are not technically yep. countries, like Hong Kong, Macau, China's yeah, going to be yeah. China's gonna be mad at me right now, like Tibet. <laughs> and yeah. I, count, I mean, they're, they're not technically countries, but I count them as countries because like what you've said, culturally different, they have their own language, yeah. they have their own money, like currency, they have their own flag. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I recognize they're not, yeah. I, I agree, it's not technically a country, but I include them in my list because it's a totally different experience. For example, you go to Hong Kong, it's a different experience yeah. as to, the, to your experience in mainland China. Or if you go especially to Tibet. Yeah. So I, I also count them as as countries. Yeah. But then there's so many places like overseas territories and so, which are technically very different. I mean, if you go to British Virgin Islands, it's not exactly like going to the UK. Exactly. Or even going to Hawaii from the US. Um, yeah. <laughs> um, it's, it's really hard to put the limit. Um, but I, I just found that this is the most diplomatic definition of a country. If you say everyone will agree that all UN members are countries. Mm -hmm. And anything after that might become a little bit politically sensitive. Right. If you say that this is a country, this is a country, either it's Greenland or Tibet, it's, yeah. Right. So, it's what, a, what, it's a, but it's a very interesting topic. <laughs> yeah. So, what I put on my list is countries and territories. I just put it that way. So, there's no debate. Yeah. But I, 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 I have to include those territories because for me, it, it, they're, they have their own language geographically separate. Yeah. So like what you said, Hawaii, you cannot yeah. just say, oh, I've been to the US, but Hawaii is so different from the from mainland yeah. US. <laughs> it is. Yeah. Yeah. Even American Samoa, it's not a country, but it's completely far away from the US and completely different. Like Virgin Island. <laughs> yeah. 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 Exactly. French Guyana, French, um, you know, Polynesia. It's not quite like France. <laughs> yeah. And uh -huh. 
when did this start and what gave you this idea to visit every country in the world? I know we all have this wanderlust gene, not, not all, mm -hmm. but some people have this wanderlust gene and we have, we have different travel goals. For, for example, my goal before was to just circumnavigate the globe. That's about it. But for you, it's, I think it's mm -hmm. a more difficult goal visiting every country. And I know also a lot of travelers out there who want to do it. Example is a famous YouTuber, Drew Binsky, that, that is also mm. his goal. So how about you? What mm. made you decide to do this feat? Yeah, uh, I don't think this happens by accident. It requires a lot of planning. Um, it, it requires a lot of priority to, to do it, a lot of time. But for me, I grew up on a very small island uh, where I took a boat to school every day. So wow. I knew very early that I wanted to leave this island. So at age 16, I moved to Austria for one year. And ever since I came back from living in Austria with a host family, going to school there, I felt a little bit like I didn't belong only in Norway, um, but I belonged a little bit in Austria. Maybe there was other places where I could feel at home. So I decided to move to the US and to South Africa and to Costa Rica for studies as part of my studies. And then I used those as bases for traveling. And at a certain point, I came to the realization that I've actually visited some of the most difficult countries in the world. And I had visited quite a lot of countries by that time. And this is also the same time as the first Norwegian had visited every country. So I thought to myself, why not set that as a goal? And I found that every country I went to were different and there was no country where I wouldn't want to go. Um, they all had something unique to them. So I was curious about that and yeah, went, went all in. So what is the most difficult part of doing this? Because I think, and I know most people think this is a di difficult feat. This is a difficult project, you know, especially financially mm -hmm. and logistically. I think it's, it's a bit easier for you guys because of your Norwegian passport. But for most people, it's, it's mm -hmm. a bit difficult. So for you, what were your mm -hmm. struggles and what do you think is was the most difficult part of visiting all of the countries in the world? Yeah, so for me, I think this motivation part, I mean, just telling yourself that this is really what you want to do, because there are so many things in life that I really want to do. I could have chosen a career, I could have chosen to have a girlfriend or, um, you know, wealth or whatever, um, like most people choose, like children. But instead of chose this and times when things go bad, um, either it's, you know, like getting robbed or stabbed, I've been imprisoned. Uh, you know, these things, they really break you down. And in these times, you really question yourself, is this worth it? Is this what I want to? And to always get back up on the horse after those moments, that's that's been quite tough because then I've been really thinking to myself, maybe my life would be better at home with a safe life, you know, with a stable stability, with with the, 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 the money and everything, because... I've done this on a quite low budget. I had never had any support either from sponsoring or from my parents for my travels. So I'd had to do it on a shoestring, hitchhiking a lot, sleeping outside, um, really trusting people um, as part of my travels. So um, so it's, it's sometimes like very tough when you don't meet anyone and you're not eating well or sleeping well and to always continue. So that's maybe the biggest <laughs> biggest challenge somehow. Oh, so there were times when you were not eating? I've gone through <laughs> Ramadan a couple of times, um, you know, and just to to live the way that people live. And that's actually been very beautiful, like because of Iftar, especially in the night where they're eating a lot and yeah. having, you know, really social, like going through Sudan where I spent one month, you know, the whole of Ramadan. Mm. And suddenly at Iftar, they stop all the buses to, to feed people everyone you're walking past they you know wave at you uh, welcoming you to come to to eat with them um but yeah going without eating is something i think eating and sleeping it's just you get it when you get it sometimes so sometimes you just have to remind yourself it's not a big deal if you don't sleep that well one night you can always catch up on the next night or yeah. if you go one day without food you can always just eat the oh, next man. day the most important is the adventure you know right I I can so even relate. The last, uh, yeah. Even the last two days, I was uh, I work as a hiking guide here in Norway, so I took this woman on a very difficult hike, and um, we had calculated a bit diff. I mean, wrong with the food and so, 
So the last day we had our couple of slices of bread in the morning and then we hiked the whole day until the evening without food. <laughs> and also in the night, it's really cold to sleep on top of the mountain. We were sleeping under the stars. Mm-hmm. But she she really appreciated this experience because she had been traveling on a comfort uh, somehow, and this was more of a adventure. There was nothing right. commercial about it. We ne- we didn't know, you know, for sure that we're gonna like how this is gonna go. <laughs> it could have taken so many different turns, but it it worked out well. We we got to see what we wanted and really had an adventure. Yeah, I can relate because when I was younger, I was also doing backpacking. And I think it's easier when you're young in, in doing the kind of travel style, you know, like what you've mentioned, yeah. sometimes you will just, you'll just say to yourself, okay, I will not be able to afford this hotel. So maybe I'll just sleep at the airport, but no worries because after a few yeah. days I'll be in this country, which is cheaper than I can splurge. Yeah. I can have a nice hotel because it's cheaper or, or I can sacrifice this meal. Maybe I'll just have two meals a day just for me to have this adventure. I remember going to exactly. Malaysia, Malaysia. I slept at the airport and I don't mind doing these things when I was younger. I was more adventurous. And, you know, typically when you're young, you don't care so much about your health. You don't think about your health that yeah. much because <laughs> I'm young, I'm I'm healthy, I'm, I'm strong. But then as I get older, I find myself, I find myself changing my, my travel style. I'm, I'm not backpacking quite as often now compared as when I was younger. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I've actually, so now I have much better finances, um, but I still can travel mostly the rough way that I used to. So I don't really sleep in hotels. I always stay with people. I do hitchhiking. Even tomorrow, I'm going to hitchhike to Oslo for a dinner, eight hours, you know, to Oslo and back the next day. And this is because I like to meet people on the way and hear stories. Because for me, traveling now is not just about seeing new places. It's more about meeting new people, trying to learn from how they have been living life and so. And that you can do in Norway as well as the rest of the world. Even, you know, within countries, when you stay with people, it's like exploring, not not countries within countries, but yeah, cultures within cultures somehow. Mm -hmm. One day you could stay, you know, I've been couch surfing with, uh, from everything from a drug dealer to a prostitute to, you know, like very religious people or... It's all so different experiences and they've lived a life where they all have something to, to teach you. So this like meeting people, teaching, learning, sharing knowledge. That's really my favorite part of, of being on the road, exposing you to, to other people. Right. And if I look back at my travels, some of the most meaningful travels I've had were the ones where I was able to hear a story from a, from a different person from people I've mm. met on the road, whether that be a local or even fellow travelers. So I agree that it's more meaningful once you interact. And this is one of mm. the best travel advice that I can give to our listeners as well. As much as possible, you have to strike a conversation, even just on the plane, you know, you, you might, you, you will have mm. a more meaningful trip if you've had lots of conversation opportunities you learn something and you're able to share your experiences as well because i I also experienced traveling without without not talking to people at all like i was i was just tired of doing that because i was doing this when i was young when i was younger then there was one travel where i just focus on myself you know just relax in a hotel and and people will try to speak to me but i will just have you know short answers and try not to speak and at the end of the day i i looking back it's like whoa like there's there's not much meaning to what i did just you know, taking pictures of major sites it's, it's not as meaningful compared to us like what you've mentioned talking to people mm, yeah yeah definitely when you left Norway and you had this project of visiting all of the countries in the world, and you've mentioned you sacrifice a lot, including relationship, job, stability. What was the reaction of those closest to you, your family, the society that you live in, or even your girlfriend? Yeah. yeah. Well, I have four brothers. And um, so there's always someone at home with my parents. But of course, they they were worried when I go to places like Syria and it's, you know, during the war or places like Afghanistan. Um, But they've always wanted me to do what I want in life and to be happy. So they learned that this is the way that I I'm truly happy. And um, they also know that I would I would call them if I need any help. 
so they 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 think that as long as there's no news there's there's it's like good um mm-hmm. and also they get to follow the story i i wrote a blog from every country in the world um i called 201 countries that come and i've been posting on social media so they've been following the journey and see that i'm happy and i'm doing what i want and um yeah then and i i i've been needing their help sometimes and they're the first one to call so um and they appreciate this this honesty in a way wow that's great uh, friends uh i've kind of lost a bit of contact with friends at home i find like i'm better at making friends on the move it doesn't matter if i know people for one day or you know 10 years um i still i'm still very trusting and i can kind of feel if you know if they're good people or not like i know who to trust somehow so i i i come to people with an open basket of trust in a way and i think that's very good because they will also open more up towards you and mm-hmm. um, and that way you can connect very fast and um yeah you'll be so the people i've been even meeting like the girl i hiked with yesterday I feel like she's a, a really good friend even though I just knew her for two days. Yeah, that's the beauty Because of backpacking. You, you know, the thing is that these people that you meet who are like other travelers, they maybe have more in common with you than the people at home who have started families and living very different from you. They don't understand the life you're living and your priorities, so Yeah, exactly. especially with backpacking with the backpacking culture you meet these fellow backpackers and you wonder because you just meet them for a day but the connection is so deep and of course you know mm. that there will come a time where you're going to separate ways because you have different itinerary and you're going to be so sad it's like it's like uh it's like being separate to a loved one kind of thing you know that that feeling mm. of departure and he's going to his to his destination as well. So have have you experienced that like being so sad because you're going to be separated to to the friends that you've made on the road? Uh well, I think that if you say goodbye to someone, it means that you will say hello to someone else somehow. So I've been focusing more about who is around the corner to meet, you know, rather than who would I leave behind to say goodbye. Mm. And also when I say goodbye I I think that it's more like see you later somehow because there's so many people I met and then just randomly you know someone my car shopping host in Honduras I met 7 years later in Penang Malaysia you mm-hmm. know working in a hostel and it's just by random that I bump into her uh you know while traveling so yeah the people who are backpacking and so I, I guess there's not that many who live this lifestyle and chances are big that you'll see each other again sometime. Mm. Okay, wow, that's interesting. That, that's a good mindset though. And I remember the movie when you were you were mentioning a while ago that sometimes on the road you will run out of money and you will contact your parents or the kind of thing. Mm. It reminded me of the movie The Art of Travel. I don't know if you've seen it. There was a scene no, in the movie. I... It's, it's a very nice yeah, movie. Check yeah, yeah, have to check it out. Okay. The Art of Travel. There was a scene there where He was in South America, I think in Nicaragua. Yeah, he was in Nicaragua and he went partying as, as what backpackers do once in a while, partying, went to a club and yeah, had had a few drinks and he and he got drunk. So he got robbed at an alley, so he lost all his money, his cards and even his clothes, his watch. And he ended up calling his parents in the US. and the dad say don't worry son i'll just i'll just wire money to your account mm. so <laughs> it reminded me of that movie when you've mentioned that once in a while you have to contact your parents for rescue as well <laughs> doing this yeah, activity yeah. it's been more like i don't know legal assistance or helping me out with banking and stuff like this that i need done in norway because when i leave sometimes i'm away for 12 months 14 months 16 months 18 months So, you know, some things that require someone to do something in person in Norway. So they would always be there for me uh for that. So um but whenever I have needed money, like even finishing this quest, I borrowed 3000 euros from them. I would just pay back as soon as possible. So it's not like getting any money from my parents. It's more like yeah, if I can't access my own money, I might have to borrow, you know. Like I came to Sudan and and I found out that no cards are valid. 
Oh wow. So um yeah, I mean you can't withdraw money. You don't you can have the best credit card in the world, but it's not gonna work. So that's crazy. Uh, because of sanctions. Yeah, like in Iran and some other countries, Syria. And uh yeah, I had my my parents had wired to the embassy so that the embassy <sighs> could give me the cash. Whoa. But then as soon as I got out of Sudan, I was just I, I wired to my parents again. So it all worked out. So how about the this how about the Norwegian society? Because in the Philippines or in most Asian countries, we are expected that after graduation, have a stable job, get a wife, yeah. start a family. And for them, for most yeah. of the people here, that is the definition of success or yeah, kind of like success. Yeah. But then what you did was you went on a different route. So I'm wondering though, how about the Norwegian society? Is it like, uh, was there like a, a, not a good reaction because maybe they will say, oh, you're wasting your life. You should start a family. You should have a stable job kind of thing. Or is it uh, quite different yeah. in Norway because this is a Western country? That's I'm just wondering. That's kind of uh, the attitude I can, you know, get from my, my grandmother, for example, like the older generation, because they were living a tougher life where you needed to kind of get married and, you know, work hard to, to survive almost. But since the 70s, um, the like the wealth of families and so have gone up quite a lot in Norway because of the oil discovery. Uh -huh. And now actually my mother told me that, you know, she worked hard through her life also because her mother told her to. And then she realized halfway that actually it's not necessary. You'll have a good life no matter. If I work 30 hours a week or, or 50 hours a week, it's pretty much the same. I'll have eat what I want and live the way I want. So there's not really any pressure for me to do well in business at all from parents. And I told them that I don't want kids. And it's quite an individualistic country um, where I am free to do what I want. So mm -hmm. this pressure, and I've, I've seen it a lot, you know, traveling the Arab world, especially South America and yeah, parts of Asia. Even in Asia. Uh, there is there is a lot of, yeah, there's a lot of pressure from from, from parents and, and families to mm. to live a certain way, but we, we don't, I didn't have that here, uh, mm. I would say. Wow, that's that's good. I, I would say that's really good. Yeah. Especially that's you. a huge privilege, actually. Yeah. It's like your yeah. passport, it's like, like money, it's, actually having the freedom and i mean you're also free to do what you want but maybe there's you know this expectations so these expectations weren't there for me and that has made it easier definitely right right that's good and it's quite a new concept to me because like growing up in asia in the philippines and even other living in other asian countries there's a huge pressure for people here to like what i've said start a family have kids and if you don't do so it's people will think of you as you're not normal you know it's like Mm. you're yeah that, that's that's so unheard of but then i was exposed to a lot of people around the world through my travels or living abroad and i've met these people from australia from the u.s and they will just say they they have a choice not to have a family or even get married but don't have kids and it's totally fine and it's so accepted in their society and i was like whoa Wow, so this this kind of thing exists. So it's it's got a new concept for us yeah. Asians, but but it's good to know. And and I think I think it's 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 a really good thing to be honest. Like you, they allow you to choose the life that you want that you would want to live. Mm. But then my grandmother telling this to her mother, and you know your parents telling it to you, this is out of love that they want the best out of you for you, in a way. Right. Um, I, I think they only mean well. It's not like yeah. so. It's, it's not like they think just for themselves or they're selfish, I think they only mean well for you because they think that is uh, the best route for you. It's not for them yeah. kind of thing. But then, yeah. yeah, sometimes you just have a different preference. Yeah, exactly. Wow, that, that's really good. So I think one of the challenges as well in doing so is the finances. So how about you? What, uh, how do you fund this trip? It is, for sure, it's it's not cheap, even yeah. even though you say, "Oh, I'm on a budget. I'll sleep in, I'll ha I'll do couch surfing, and all this stuff." But at the same time, you know, traveling is is not cheap, uh, relatively yeah. not cheap. So, how about you? How do you fund this? Yeah, it's a question I get a lot, and it's actually quite easy in Norway. You can work a summer. I worked as a guide, but before I worked in a kindergarten, I worked in a shop. I've taken all kinds of jobs just for two three months. And in, you know, three, four months, you can easily, easily save up 10,000 euros in Norway. And with 10,000 euros, you can imagine you can travel for a year plus 
you, if you go to Asia and so you can live like a king. Oh, for sure. <laughs> so um, this is this is one way. But I also been working with travel. I've been a travel agent online for years, helping people realize their travel dreams and, and making money of it. And I've also I am a tour operator. I not mm. only guide people here in Norway, but I, I take people around the world. So wow. a couple of months ago, I was organizing a trip to Iraq uh, for 10, 12 people. And um, I had spent over two months in Iraq earlier this year, and I found my favorite places. And these were places that I wanted to show people. So I put up a tour. Um, people were happy to chip in. It was like a good price. And um, I made something on the site. And this is what I want to do moving forward. So in a week, I will go to Canada where I have two cars and I will drive for 10 months through the Americas. And anyone is welcome to join. People chip in 1000 per month. And then we will have, you know, professional camping gear. Um, I've done this for like a long time before. I, I did seven months from Norway to South Africa with a car and a group. Whoa. I did four and a half months from Norway to Iraq last year. Ah, that's amazing. And I did uh, four and a half months from Norway to Ghana three years ago. I did one road trip in Australia for two months, all where people were just, uh, you know, chipping in and joining. So this way we can also have more of an adventure. It's not, we have a, a date, you know, a rough idea of where we'll be when. Every month we are sure where we'll be. So people come in and some people, when some people leave. And we are free to explore and be flexible and meet people and yeah, have an adventure. Wow, that's amazing. So how do you feel having this kind of lifestyle? Do you do you feel like you're a bird just being able to go anywhere yeah. and so free? Uh, I do, I do. I choose my own life and it's something that I worked hard on as well. But now it's suddenly getting more, you know, easier. So I just want to sail with this wind for as long as I have the health to do so. Mm -hmm. So for the, the, the coming years, this, this is what I'll be doing. Um, I kind of want to start like this vagabonding club. So that's I'm always on the move. And if people want to tag along, no matter where I am, they are welcome to do so. So after these 10 months, we'll probably ship the cars from South America to either Europe or to Africa to continue driving. Wow. So basically, I could be on the road for years and, um, you know, have people coming along, um, getting to know people, always either going to places I've been before to show them or to discover new places. So this is the, the life I want to live. And uh, so far, I, I, I love it. It's the best way to travel for me, to drive yeah. around and camp. Oh, wow. Well. Yeah. What kind of cars were those? Um, well, it's been going, you know, from Toyota Hiasis in Africa <clears throat> to old Toyota Hiasis, which can really last forever. They just fix them all the time. I drove Toyota RAV4 to Iraq, and now we are driving Jeep Wrangler Rubicons. So they amazing, are quite man. an upgrade. Yeah. Amazing, amazing 2019, they, they can really climb a tree if they want to. They are yeah. really top-notch for this kind of oh, travel. Wow. So we can drive on the beach, we can drive into the forest, just pitch yeah. your tent far away from people and be self-sufficient. Yeah, you can go wrong with That's Toyota and Jeep. Yeah. Ama amazing yeah. vehicles. So uh, have you yeah. also experienced having, I, I didn't know this is a thing, but I've, I've interviewed some travelers and they mentioned to me about travel depression and also full-time YouTubers, vlog, travel vloggers, they will have like, they will reveal suffering through depression because of too much traveling, something like that. So how about you? Have you also experienced this uh, depression because of, of too much traveling? Uh, I have, but it has been in moments where I've been down, you know, especially because of health. Mm -hmm. I remember one time I was in Cameroon and I had malaria. And I was on my way to the hospital to get treatment. And on the way to the hospital, my taxi was attacked by this group of maybe eight, nine robbers. Oh. And they, I had all my valuables with me and my friends were with me and they took the valuables of my friends. So what I did, I was holding onto my backpack for my dear life. And they actually pulled me through the taxi over my friend's lap outside oh, with this backpack. And I was defending myself, you know, punching the guy a couple of times. And oh. And his friend came around with a knife and he stabbed me here in the hand. 
So I still have my scar in my hand from being stabbed while I had <laughs> malaria on the way to the hospital. <laughs> and uh, when I came to the hospital, I, I didn't get treatment at first because I had no money. I had no passport, no credit cards. Everything was gone. But luckily I had some friends who I called who came with cash so that I got treatment both for my stabbing wound and for my malaria. But this was like afterwards, first of all, I was very sick and I was so exhausted because I felt like humankind had kind of like disproved me wrong that, you know, people are good. I'm, I'm a trusting guy and suddenly this happens. Right. So right. I also lost all my pictures. I had been driving four months from Norway down to Cameroon at that time. Mm. My hard drive, my pictures were all gone. And then three months later, when we finally arrived in South Africa, I had my camera stolen again. So the rest of the pictures were gone. So basically oh. seven months of pictures wiped out, except for the ones I uploaded on social media. So this was, this sent me into depressions, both those times where I was thinking, you know, like I should have just stayed home. This is my fault. And, um, I was I was exhausted mentally, mentally and physically. Yeah, whoa. But then I go home and I stay home for a few months, and then I think, oh, you know, I want to be out again. So it never lasts long. Yeah, I think, like, especially for long term travel, really need that you know vacation from our vacation. You know, kind of like yeah. uh, downtime. Oh, that's that's crazy. That's a crazy story. You have a battle scar now. Like you can, you can, yeah. you can, you can always tell that story to people. Yeah, 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 and those those are just stories. When you think about it afterwards, I mean, maybe these people needed the money more than me, and you know, it's a lesson somehow. So even the the bad travel moments are, yeah, they're good stories, but they're good lessons for you in life. So I wouldn't want to be without them. I wouldn't want everything to go smoothly. Everything is good. You need to have times when you go down to really feel the up. For sure, for sure. Oh, so, yeah. And if you look back at your travels, those are the ones that make it colorful. You know, it's not it's not the ones that you just lay on the beach drinking cocktail or something all the time. <laughs> you know, these exciting yeah. stories are what brings color yeah, to your travel experiences. Yeah, absolutely. So you've been to, uh, of course, you've been to all of the countries. <laughs> Which countries do you think you felt really unsafe and are really dangerous? Because in my experience, a lot of countries are tagged as dangerous so i go to this particular country mm. and i find it to be not dangerous at all an example is north korea like, yeah. there's a common belief north yeah, korea yeah. is a dangerous country i went there it's i think it's one of the safest countries to travel to yeah they say so china too. is dangerous and I, I i can really say here that living in china for six years that china especially beijing is one of the safest cities in the world i can safely say that so a lot of misconceptions. I went to Palestine. It was always on the news. I was hesitant to go there because, because of uh, what's what I see on the news. But when I went to Palestine, the friendliest locals I've met. So how about you? Like, what yeah. do you think are the legit dangerous countries that you've been to that you can say this country is dangerous? Well, my definition of what is a dangerous country is mostly related to how much does the government have control of the country. So the countries you mentioned, you know, North North Korea and China. The government has total control of its population. For Thereby, sure. it's the safest countries in the world, like you're saying. And some places where the government has no control, it doesn't have to be the government. It could also be, you know, a militia group, someone who's like, yeah, has like control, it's, it makes stability. And some of the places with the least stability would probably be Yemen, uh, Somalia, um, Afghanistan. And who knows, you know, with the current situation where there's like one group controlling the whole country, maybe it will be more stability than before. And thereby, by my definition, uh, more safe than before. But we will we will see about that. But um, fighting is usually because there are different interests and like different strong parts that are controlling different parts of the country and so on. So, so those countries will probably be the most dangerous. How about Central African Republic? <laughs> yeah. Well, when I was there, it was very little government control. It's maybe yeah. the, one of the countries closest to anarchy in a way. So um, I was actually flying in from, from Chad and my embassy really recommended. They were going to fly there as well for a meeting, but they canceled because of an attack of a church 
where they killed lots of people with machine guns and then they took the priest, oh. burning him, you know, cutting him open, carrying him through the street. This is downtown in Bangui. And right after I flew in there uh, while this, you know, mess was going on. Um, so definitely that was one of the most unsafe countries I've been to at the time. Oh, wow. I'm not sure now anymore. I don't follow much news. Um, I just go because I think that maybe there's never a good time to go to such countries in a way. Mm -hmm. Same with Corona now, you know, it, maybe it gets better or maybe it gets worse. Maybe there's something restricting us in the future. And I think this environment thing also will have to be, there will have to be restrictions on travel in the future. Mm -hmm. So I choose to travel now while I can because, yeah, you never know how long it will last. Also with the health. Yeah, yeah. And that's also one of my mottos. Like at this age where you still have the vitality and health, uh, I want to travel as much as possible as well, because I don't want to do this when I'm already, you know, very old. Even if you have the time and the money, so as as, as early as possible, I also want to do it. Do this. That's why I also quit my job for me to be able to do it. And I watched your TED talk. That was that was really an amazing TED talk, man. Congratulations for that. That, that yeah, was good. I, I really like it. And yeah. you've you've mentioned there that news agency uh, press labeled you as being naive and reckless yeah. you're a reckless traveler you went to afghanistan you went to syria and these are war torn countries but at first you, you got you were hurt by those words but now you embrace them and and you're not hurt anymore with these words yeah. that you're being labeled with why is that like being naive for you is is not a bad thing after all Mm. Well, actually, my naivety, my my belief in people, uh, trust in people has opened me to have the experiences that I've had. I wouldn't have made all those friends that I did if I didn't, you know, stay at their house and, and really trust them. And from all the people, like I have probably like 200 plus days in couchsurfing, for example, and none of them are bad experiences. All of them were good people who I trusted and who didn't, you know, abuse my trust. So I believe that even though you can have situations where, um, you know, maybe you shouldn't have trusted somehow, like 99.9% of the times, actually people are good and they mean you well, as long as you are coming there in peace and showing that, that you take one step towards them. So if you Google my name, you'll find over a hundred news articles, um, especially stories from Afghanistan, trusting strangers, staying with people uh, in times of war. And, you know, staying with these people really got me an insight into their culture. And actually these people who I stayed with were the ones who were making me keep uh, staying safe. If I would have stayed at the tourist hotels, it's more likely that this would be a target for attack than someone's home. So so I really believe in this type of, of travel, to travel um, in the homes of, of people. And, you know, of course, always trying to give back somehow um, either it is to kind of inspire people or teach something or even help through, you know, I was working as a teacher for one month because I was staying with a teacher in Sudan or helping out one guy run a bar in Liberia. Like these kind of experiences is, is, is really um, something I, I wouldn't want to be without. And for that to happen, I had to trust people. Yeah, yeah. And I remember the book On the Land on the trail of Genghis Khan by Tim Cope. There's a book and also a documentary. He traveled just by a horse from from Mongolia to Europe to mm -hmm. to what country was that? Danube River, oh, what kind of, Hungary. From Mongolia to Hungary, okay, yeah. just uh, using a horse or just by walking. And he was interviewed and they asked him if he did bring a gun or if, if he's bringing a gun, he said, no, I opt not to bring a gun because I believe in, in the goodness of people. So yeah. he said that people are more innately good than evil. So that's a very, yeah, that's yeah. a very good statement. Yeah. So uh, maybe I'm, maybe I'm naive, but um, that's, that's the way I want to be. I want to believe that people are good until proven otherwise. Right. And I think you would, you would be able to prove this once you travel more. And I think most of the people who are scared of other people or places are the ones 
who do not travel to that particular yes, place. Exactly. That's yeah, what yeah, I yeah. noticed. And that was me before traveling. I was scared of these particular places. But when I got there, I noticed like in general, more people are kind than evil. Like more people would want you to yeah. enjoy, more people would want you to 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 present their place to you for you to have a good time in their country. People genuinely mm -hmm. would do that to you, even in even in countries deemed as dangerous, like like in South America, in in Arab countries, which we think are dangerous. People there, genuinely, the locals would want you to have a good time in their country. And I realized this when I actually travel. Yeah. So I mean, if these people say that me, who have first-hand experiences from visiting every single country in the world, and the one who is naive, and they're the ones who are staying behind is kind of the one that is right, then that's that's fine with me. Because like, I actually know what it's like there. They, they don't. So they can just shout whatever they want from their homes, like their same safe homes with the sofa and stuff. And it doesn't, it doesn't hurt me anymore. Exactly, exactly. Because I think, I think you know better. That's why it doesn't hurt you. And think about it like the the irony these people who are just who are just in their homes are the ones saying that you're naive to be honest like yeah, yeah. you haven't been to afghanistan yeah. and, and but oh. you experience it firsthand and, and they say you're reckless but you were able to yeah. experience it. same same feeling with me when people tell me that why did i go to north korea it's a dangerous country and sometimes i would read articles especially when one american tourist died and there are comments on mm -hmm. the internet which says why why in the world would he go to North Korea? So, so you know, but these people yeah. haven't been to North Korea or even China. Like here in our country, there's a not not just in the country, but around the world, probably like there's 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 a belief that China is not safe, maybe because of I don't know, maybe Western propaganda. So I find it yeah. hard to explain sometimes to them, and they won't believe me. But if you ask these people who 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 believe that China is not safe, these are the ones who haven't been to China. Yeah, and. Um yeah true but the thing is like these stories they also exist like the guy in the, in north korea who was you know tortured to death this american of course this exists but there's so much more than that so when you hear stories from war in syria uh you know war is actually geographically limited it's contextually limited it's like limited by the time you know so obviously i wouldn't be the place where the war is going on and it's it's true you can go and see for yourself there are kilometers and kilometers with destroyed buildings but still there's so much more than that so um that's what i want to share um that actually yes there are dangers but there's also so much more there are millions of people living in every country so that, um that is one of the biggest lessons really grasp, I've learned. it's like they, they they really focus on this limited things that they've heard and this becomes the full truth of them but the full truth is actually much more complex uh, much more rich you know much more actually beautiful some places that's one of the biggest lessons i've learned in my travel i can say is like what you've mentioned geographically I, I like the word that you've used because what happens is you watch this news on tv and what is shown on tv inside inside the square is your perception of the whole country a perfect example yeah. of this was, I remember when I was in mainland China, I have plans of going to Hong Kong. But then when I watched the news, during the time there was a protest. So there were there were lots of, of fighting between civilians and, and police. And you see that on TV. So you have this idea that it's happening all over Hong Kong. And I know a lot of friends canceled their bookings of going to Hong Kong during the time. Their hotels were booked. They canceled it. Some are even non-refundable because what they saw on the news is the fighting in Hong Kong. But for me, I still went to Hong Kong because I did have a chance. I need to renew my visa. So even if I didn't want to go because because I think it's dangerous, I still went because I really need the the, the visa renewal. Oh, when I got to Hong Kong, <laughs> the ones that are the ones that they were fighting are are very limited geographically. Like it's, it's just in yeah. one place, and the whole of Hong Kong was peaceful. There are even places in Hong Kong where you don't know that they are fighting. They are protests. Yeah, yeah. Unless you go to the particular site, which is just a small, small, uh, small place, relatively. Yeah. And it, because that was the one that that was a video. Then your whole perception of Hong Kong was like that. Same when I went to Palestine. Yeah. Before going to Palestine there was a war between Israel and Palestine, but that was in Gaza and there was even the West yeah. Bank. So I was like, I did, at first I didn't want to go to, I didn't want to continue my trip, 
but I'm just glad I did because when I was in the West Bank, the fighting was in Gaza. So this is what's happening, I think. Yeah. And as travelers, you're usually not allowed to go to areas where there's fighting going on. There will usually be checkpoints by military and they will turn you around. Right. Yeah. A, a good example as well is here in Mindanao, in, in the southern part of the Philippines. It's always on the news because there are, certain, there are parts of Mindanao, but just provinces where they're fighting, especially before. Now it's getting better. But mm -hmm. then most people in, in Luzon, in the other island of the Philippines, think that the whole of Mindanao is a war zone. <laughs> but Some if you can't... think maybe that, that the whole Philippines is dangerous, you know, which is like 6,000 islands. I don't know. Exactly. <laughs> because of like these stories. So exactly yeah. like like i mean just need to go yeah so I, I wrote a book actually called go discover in norwegian it was the world might not be as dangerous as you think but then because of this press i got for the book you know because of this title because i'm talking about the whole world not just these examples of the place with war um i got a lot of you know pepper for it so i changed it to go discover the world might be different than you think and when it published in english but I think oh. the first title is better. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I, I got a lot of attention for it. So uh, I have it here um, next to me. And uh, yeah. So is, is it already published? It's, it's published in Norwegian, English and Arabic and being translated into uh, French as we speak. Oh, and I'll that's show you amazing. the cover. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's not where I thought it was, but uh, I have uh, I have this book with 320 pages, lots of pictures, and mostly it's uh, travel stories with kind of like the lessons I learned from places, stories of people I meet, and you know, things that surprise me and so. So it sold well, um, especially here in Norway. The whole um, it's pretty much sold out. The, the 2,000 copies are printed, and now I'm writing my second book about these countries that are not countries. That's amazing, man. So how can people order yeah. your book? So I just posted today on my story on Instagram. Um, I have a 50% closing sale on all of my books. Um, the Arabic version you can get for free because there's been so many people in the Arabic world who helped me. So I wanted to translate it and give it to all of them as a thank you. So go to my Instagram, Vagabjorn or webpage vagabjorn.com and you'll see the, the books listed there. And you were able to go to Afghanistan and you had a good experience. I've I've read your, I've read some articles and also your interview with Risa. So yeah. can you tell us more about Afghanistan, your experience there? Because Afghanistan now is, is on the headlines of, of what's because of what's happening there. So how about you? What was your experience yeah. when you were there? It's a little bit politically sensitive topic, but like what I want to, I mean, I'm not involved in politics. I'm more involved in just sharing stories about people. So uh, when I went, I ended up popping in a taxi from the north, from Azar Sharif, through the Hindu Kush down to Kabul. And there I met a guy called uh, Nasser, who I met through couchsurfing. And he invited me to go to the Panjshir Valley to, you know, hang out with him and his friends. And through them, I got to ex learn a lot about what life is like in Afghanistan. Um, I got to join his friends to uh, teach an English class in, in Kabul. And, you know, it's, it was obvious that it was quite tense with the military. And so, especially with like Western forces driving all around with huge vehicles, you know, helicopters flying everywhere. Um, but at the same time, there was people going to school and work and restaurants and so on. And now, of course, it's, it's very sad. A lot of things happening there. Um, but even at the time in 2018, maybe half of the country was controlled by the by the Taliban already. So it's these changes we're seeing is, I guess, more in the, the big cities um, where, you know, a lot of the, the, the people are quite conservative already, um, wearing burqa and so already. But um, yeah, I, um, I was actually going to invite my friend, like this guy to come to Norway and uh, making an invitation letter and then suddenly saw it on the news you know all this happening so fast so he didn't get out in time that i really think about the people i met there um how they are and hope hope they can come and get get to stay with me here in norway i yeah I'm, I'm really oh, in that wow. i'm really i'm really grateful for for what they showed me about about their country and life there 
Mm -hmm. Wow. It's really one of, it's really on my bucket list. Really wanted to go to Afghanistan, but because of what's happening now, I think it's going to be uh, for a long time again before opening. This is interesting. This is, you know, as a backpacker, I think it's, it has, we have to really go there because that was like the start of, of backpacking in, in Asia, like the hippie trail. <laughs> yeah, Afghanistan, yeah. the hippie trail, you know, there's a gringo trail in South America and the hippie trail in, in Central Asia, like the birth of, of backpacking. So it, it's good that you were able yeah. to visit it. I'm so jealous. Who knows? We'll, we'll see how the situation ends, you know, in a few years. Maybe it's even possible to go there during, you know, Taliban rule. We'll, we'll see. We'll see. We'll see. Hopefully. Yeah. There's a question here from Instagram. I posted it on story on my Instagram story. And there's a question from Higa Michael Bust. The question yeah. is, what luggage do you travel with? How many liters? And what is your best pack? I travel hack? very light. I travel with a backpack that fits on Ryanair and, uh, <laughs> you know, EasyJet and all of these cheap airlines. And it's basically the simplest, you know, like school rucksack. And in there, I either have my one kilo, I mean, less than one kilo tent. It's more like a baby bag and um, a tiny sleeping bag or a hammock. So the last weeks traveling around Europe, I was sleeping a lot in my hammock, even in the cities, between the parks, stringing up my hammock in the park. Why not? Um, sleeping is like eating for me. I, I just, as long as I have enough of it, I'm, I'm fine. It doesn't matter if it's a five-star hotel or under a million stars, you know, in the wild. So I travel very, very light. One item I can't travel without is a scarf. I have found so many uses for a scarf. Oh, Either really? it's a towel or like you know, a, mask. a bag. Or mask, exactly. Um, you oh. know, for girls also to carry carry scarves is very useful when you go to Muslim countries. Uh, to cover. Right. So, uh, yeah, bring a scarf. Yeah, that's interesting because like most backpackers that we that there's a, we have like a, uh, an image of a backpacker where they have huge huge backpacks like a typical backpacker you know but you, you have a, a day pack like a, a, like you've mentioned normal yeah, yeah, school yeah. rucks rucksack <laughs> yeah have one clean set of clothes and one which you can can clean at times so that's that's all you need if you go right. to the caribbean for example you can just travel with a t-shirt and a swim shorts i mean it's so warm day and night and you can sleep outside without a sleeping bag. Yeah. It's and the freest and, life uh, when you go in places like that. That's why Southeast Asia is my favorite backpacking destination. Yeah. My, because yeah, you can just yeah, wear flip flops, you know? Yeah. Shorts exactly. and flip flops. Uh, I yeah, love Southeast yeah. Asia. I've done lots of hikes, uh, you know, in Indonesia. And so with flip flops as well. And people always comment when I do it. But uh, for me, it works. All right. And. Yeah, I, ha I have to ask you these questions because you've been to all countries in the world. What is your favorite country? Hmm. My favorite <laughs> country is Ethiopia. Oh yeah, Ethiopia. I read that. Yeah, I've, re I've read that. Do you love coffee? I think it's one of the one of the most diverse countries in the world. I do love coffee. I do drink a lot of coffee, which was discovered in Ethiopia, seven hundred years before the Arab world, and it's kind of the or like land of origins, not just for coffee, but even for humankind and for Rastafari culture and so so many things. And, uh, you know, if it goes to the south, the tribal south, it's so different from, you know, the Muslim East or, you know, the, the Christian and even Jewish uh, people in the north. Yeah, so, it's, uh, it's interesting. It really, really fascinating. Yeah. And the food is really good, too. Yeah, in injera. <laughs> injera, yeah, exactly. Injera. Every day. Wow. Uh, how do you find Ethi Ethiopian coffee, especially Yirgaf? How do you say it? Yirgaf? Yirgaf? Coffee? How yeah, do you find interesting. it? interesting. The... Really, what I really like, like every time you serve coffee, you also get it with popcorn. Oh, really? <laughs> Which is quite, yeah, it's quite random. But it's, yeah, they have these so coffee strange. ceremonies. They call it buna in, in Ethiopia. Mm -hmm. And they sit on the ground making these small cups of coffee. And you just drink one and they're boiling more. And, you know, you can sit for hours drinking coffee. Yeah, that's and interesting. Well, I think if you're yeah. a coffee lover, you have to you have to be in Ethiopia, Italy, and Vietnam. Like these countries fill yeah. up coffee. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. True. How about favorite food? What is your favorite food? It would probably be Indian or Pakistani. I find I'm not a vegan myself. I have been for a couple of years, but I find, you know, like healthy food, like I, I love eating healthy. And, and sometimes they're very creative, both with the spices and the, and the vegetables they use. They eat a lot of food, which is vegetarian. 
So all these, especially dal, you know, lentils, uh, like mishmash sauces, uh, thali, you know, where you have the bread. I love, I love, I love thali. And all these small dishes. Ah, that, that, that plate is, oh yeah. So yeah. I, I, I think you're struggling in Norway now because eating all of these exciting cuisine, especially Asian cuisine, and then you're back in Norway just eating Norwegian food. Yeah. I mean, you need variety. Yeah, we, <laughs> we eat uh, bread uh, three times a day. It's terrible. <laughs> yeah. And we have one uh, one warm meal at five or six. That's that's how we eat. That, that's the thing. But uh, it's, uh, it's a habit. It's kind of nice to not choose all the time. Like whenever I wake up in the morning and when I have a, have a lunch, I just know it's going to be bread. So I don't have to think about it, preparing mm. anything. But yeah, I, I get sick of it. I want to go out and eat <laughs> uh, different foods. That was my struggle when I went to Europe because in Asia, in the Philippines, we eat three hot meals a day. It's crazy for for, for yeah. Westerners. But in, when I was in Europe, they, you just you just just eat one hot meal a day, and that that is just dinner or sometimes just lunch. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, and wow, it was really nice talking to you, Bjorn. And wow, yeah. uh, it's, it's, it's an honor for you to be here on the podcast. You're one of the, you belong to an exclusive club, being able, one of the few people to be able to travel to all of the countries in the world. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. It was and, a pleasure. And for our last question, since we are in a pa pandemic and you're, you're back at home with, with your family, with, with your parents, and you've mentioned in the interview with Risa that it has its advantages because you're you've you've been gone for quite a while and it's a it's a good opportunity for you to foster that relationship again so any just final message to yeah. our travelers out there who are stuck and are you know kind of depressed not being able to travel so any lessons from from that uh stay of yours in norway because of the pandemic mm. well i was in a situation where i couldn't go anywhere in the beginning in march 2020 and that really gave me an opportunity to connect with my parents, for example, on a different level. So, I mean, to really appreciate what I have here at home. So, like, being forced not to travel was kind of a good thing for me. I ended up getting an apartment, fixing it up here, uh, which has actually made me more free because I can rent it out when I travel. So, it happened in the right time of my life. <laughs> not sure everyone can say the same, but it's it was, um, like, even getting to understand the privilege of travel and even maybe enjoying it more because you know you're not taking it for granted as much so just get ready when you're traveling again you will yeah i think enjoy it even more than before yeah and you've mentioned having a vespa and just driving around that's that's, that's yeah. cool man <laughs> yeah 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 and final message to our listeners out there who also want to travel to every country in the world or to have this big travel project. Yes, um, you know, you don't have to be a millionaire. Everything doesn't have to be right. Sometimes it's just, you know, about taking the first step, going somewhere. And then, you know, this will get you eager to go further. So if you have a um, small motorbike, which most people in the Philippines have, for example, you know, <laughs> uh, or wherever you are, just get on the bike or get in the car and just drive and camp, you know, it's, it doesn't have to be everything organized uh, because that's when you have the most adventures uh, as well. All right. Thank you, Bjorn. And before we end, I'm going to read this travel quote. In our fear of death, let us not forget to live by Crisette Lauretta Chu. Okay. So by that quote, yes. And May you just please announce where where can they contact you, like your Instagram account or your website? Yes, on YouTube, Facebook, Instagram, my name is Vaga Bjorn. It's a mix of Vagabond, which I am, full-time traveler almost, and Bjorn, which is my name. So vagabjorn.com, Vagabjorn on Insta. Um, you'll find links, links to my book, to my TEDx there, um, to my trips for my 10-month upcoming trip. I hope that as many people I can join as possible. Um, anyone is welcome, young, old, you know, any gender, anything. And uh, yeah, I hope uh, to see people on the road and that people will go explore. Yeah, guys, I would recommend you to watch his TED Talk. That was really amazing. One of the best uh, travel TED Talks I've seen on YouTube. So just search uh, Yorn Bjorn, August Todd on YouTube. It's amazing. 
thank you guys for tuning in. This has been your host, Regin Reino. Till the next episode.